Um, so um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Habi Antin, who is the director for the uh, Center for Mathematics and Artificial Intelligence, uh, and also professor at the math department at Chalk Manson University. Professor Antin is, uh, uh, is um, uh, has, is pretty young, but he's obtained a lot of um, distinguished um, uh, recognition, like he's the co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of, uh, of the advances in this field and continuous model, and he's an editor of the SIAM Review. Um, so he's, uh, he was a research fellow at Brown University. He's an associate editor for math control and related fields, and, and he got a lot of, a lot of grants. Um, so today he's going to tell us um, about uh, fractional operator in physics and data science. So please, uh, um, Habia, you can continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vin, for this uh, humbling introduction. And also thanks to Alejandro for uh, inviting me and, and giving this opportunity to, uh, to talk to your group at uh, SMU. So can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. So I actually have been to SMU a couple of times. So I did my PhD at University of Houston. And uh, I, I remember, uh, I think it was Tom uh, Hackstrom. He organized a couple of uh, rodeos at SMU, uh, this finite element rodeo. And I, I came to, uh, came, came, came to participate and I also uh, happened to give some talks in there. I remember Johannes, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I remember meeting him. I, I, I'm, I doubt he will remember me at this point, but, but it was really nice. I happened to go to also uh, one of the football games at SMU actually, the, it, was, it, was, it was a good experience. And I hope to visit again sometime. So uh, let, let me start today's talk. So it's going to be a, a, a little technical, um, especially in the first part of the talk, I will uh, focus on, on these fractional operators, non-local operators that uh, my group has been working on for the, for the last couple of years. Um, and then in the second part of the talk, I will uh, mention some data science applications. Um, so I could have uh, flipped it around, but um, I thought this will give a sort of a broader perspective on, on what we've been doing. So this research is uh, funded by National Science Foundation, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and also Department of Navy. So I'll start with uh, some applications uh, related to, so something is going on. Ah. So I'll start with some applications related to non, this non-local or these fractional operators. Um, one. One basic example, which is relatively easy to explain is uh, the so-called image denoising problem. So let's say you're given some noisy image F and you want to do a reconstruction U, uh, which does not have any noise. Typically uh, one add the so-called total variation semi norm. Here I formally wrote as the, uh, the, uh, the L1 norm of the gradient, but this needs to be understood in the sense of distributions and alpha is some regularization parameter. So even if you can write uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations in this case, they will be non-linear and degenerate uh, set of partial differential equations. So a, a few years ago, together with uh, my uh, collaborator, Soren Bartels from University of Freiburg in Germany, we replaced this uh, total variation semi-norm by, by this object, which is delta S over two. Here, this S is between zero and one, and this is what I call the fractional Laplacian. And the key advantage of uh, writing, uh, replacing this term by this object is um, that if you write the, the optimality conditions or the Euler-Lagrange equations, you get a linear um, PDE. So I replaced a highly nonlinear degenerate model by a linear equation. Now you may say that, of course, this is harder to solve, right? It's not the usual Laplace equation where you can multiply by a test function and use the finite element method or something else. Uh, in fact, uh, keeping in mind the application that we are interested in, since images are typically given on square or rectangular domains, uh, and it's not clear what the boundary condition should be on the image, so I can just use a simple uh, fast Fourier transform to solve this actually. So uh, it's just a five lines of code in MATLAB uh, if, 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 if you want to do it. So it's FFT2 and IFFT2 basically. Um, so 
if you start with, for instance, such a noisy image, on the left you see is the original image. So the noisy image is this, uh, it's the famous picture of Gauss, of course, uh, which is my F. And then I solve this equation. It takes, I don't know, 0 0.001 second to solve this. For an exponent, which was like 0.4, we get a reconstruction of this type, the, the third image uh, from the left. Uh, it's, it's not bad at all, right? You can capture the, the, the color, uh, for example. So you can capture the sharp features, uh, hairstyle. Um, the one on the right is the reconstruction done using a total variation semi-norm where we even optimize over uh, this parameter alpha. And it takes a while actually to, to get this result because it's really an iterative method. And here I'm just doing one linear solve. So, something is going on can you see my full full slide uh yeah i mean it's still the gauss so slide if that's what you're asking yeah it's cutting can you see the last bullet on the slide well it says non-convex that's the last thing we can read ah so see that's yeah it's not showing up properly hold on sorry i'll try to share again Okay, so of course we still need to identify the, the exponent s and the parameter alpha. And especially if you enforce some constraint on exponent s, the problem becomes uh, non-smooth, right? And also non-convex. Um, and this is where in the first place, we, we use sort of machine learning ideas to, to learn this exponent s and, and, uh, and, and this parameter alpha, which is my regularization parameter. So now I'm working with a more general uh, problem um, where I introduced this operator K. And this is uh, like, so, like a radon transport, for example, when you're talking about uh, tomographic reconstructions. This is a joint work with uh, uh, Wendy D from Argonne National Lab and, and a former PhD student, Ratna Kadri. So pre previously I showed you this lower level model now I've introduced an upper level model as well. So this becomes a bi-level optimization problem where we are looking for the exponent S and also the parameter alpha. And, uh, and we compare the regularization that we, uh, that we introduced in the previous slide for image denoising, but for this tomographic reconstruction problem uh, with the total variation result. So there is a lot going on in this slide and I will, uh, I'll, I'll be rather quick. Uh, what I just wanna show you is a couple of these curves. So here, in what we are we are learning uh, just the um, ec the parameter alpha for the moment, but we have results in the paper where you learn both S and alpha, uh, and and then you carry out the prediction. So the red curve corresponds to uh, this fractional Laplacian regularization, and blue curve corresponds to total variation regularization. Uh, higher the better. So this is what they call PSNR or signal to no noise ratio. And this is structural similarity index. Um, again, the red curve is above the blue curve. So we are doing better actually, uh, if you use this fractional Laplacian regularizer. Black curve corresponds to the case where there is no regularizer. Uh, so, um, all right. So, and, and what, we, what we do here is in terms of machine learning, um, we, 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 we solve, let's say lower level problem using some gradient descent scheme and you consider the it iterates of your gradient descent as uh, your layers in your neural network, for instance. You can find more details in, 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 in this paper. So just for, for fun, uh, again, a couple of years ago, together with a collaborator, uh, Rautenberg, we replaced that, con that constant S that we had, the exponent S uh, previously by a function S and we allow S to touch the extreme cases of zero and one. So coming back to the imaging application, when you have uh, jump discontinuities, right? Uh, you don't want to enforce any smoothing, but previously we were enf enforcing this S smoothing. So, but you want to set S to be zero, just L2 function, right? Uh, in the flat regions, so here, for instance, in the flat region, you want to set S to one, that is you want to enforce H1 regularity if you're, if you're familiar with Sobolev spaces. So th that will kill the noise completely. 
And that's what we do in this framework, actually. There are, there are more details. I'm gonna come back to this uh, if there is time. Um, so if the, 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 the key point is if you start with such a noisy image, um, the reconstruction that you get is the one on the right. You get an almost perfect reconstruction using this regularizer, which is a variable order. Uh, the middle picture is uh, what you get if you use total variation semi-norm. Is total TV has a has a uh, an artifact from the numerical point of view. It tends to round up the corners, which is what we see. So, and this work is published in SIAM Journal of Math Analysis. In case you're interested. Rabir, can I ask a question? Yes. On the notation, is X in the dependencies of X axis the spatial variable? And you're... that is correct. Is this and so? It's two dimensional. It can be any dimension, but in a, in this uh, case, it's two dimension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Now uh, there there could be, uh, you know, these variations or heterogeneity that might be different in one direction versus the other. Has there been any work in which you, instead of doing minus Laplacian fractional, um, that each direction may have a fractionality that is independent that reflects perhaps a different level of heterogeneity in one direction versus the other? Um, I mean, so instead could, of writing so minus right. Laplacian S of X, I say minus second derivative in X to the power uh -huh. S one, minus second derivative of y to the power s2 and s1 and s2 can be independently it's, calibrated. It's, it's possible to do that. And I will, when I introduce the definition of this operator, you will see how that, that case can be handled. Uh, okay. We only focused on this particular case, but soon I will show you the definition and, and then we can discuss on how to extend that framework uh, further actually. There is some very recent work uh, on that particular case. And I can I can I can give, provide you the reference. Uh, still, there is a lot of math that needs to be developed. It's right. Uh, Thank it's, you. It's, Thank it's, you. It's, it's it's very basic actually, uh, at the moment. So, so uh, yeah, go ahead, please. So for this S, do you need to optimize that as well? So you have a. So uh, that's a very good question, actually. So as well. So in the in this paper, we did not uh, optimize our S. What we did was. We uh, we make image as a as a, a piecewise linear function. So all the discretization was done using finite element method. We make image as a piecewise linear function. We compute the gradient of that piecewise linear function, and we uh, normalize it. Uh, and then we set s to be one minus that that normalized gradient. So if the gradient is large, mm -hmm. uh, where you have jumps, that means one minus that will be uh, close to zero, right? Uh, and then if gradient is small in the flat regions, then that will be, S will be equal to close to one. So we did this crude approximation in this paper, but uh, ideally you want to do a, a sort of a bi-level framework that I described on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, there was a lot of other delicate things for this problem. Uh, we were tired by the end of the paper and we just wanted to uh, wrap it up. All right. Thank you. Good, yeah, good questions. So uh, we have also extended uh, these ideas of using this fractional operator uh, or this non-local operator, which will be clear from the definition pretty soon uh, to the so-called diffusion maps. So these diffusion map ideas are, are used widely actually when you're given a cloud of data and you want to fit a manifold through the data. Uh, typically people use the uh, heat kernel, which uh, leads to uh, this Laplace Beltrami operator um, on, on the surface being generated by connecting these points. But we use this uh, non-local kernels, uh, which will lead to this fractional uh, Laplacian if you look at the continuum limit. This work is published in Applied and Computational Harmonic Analysis Journal, uh, actually just got published. Uh, in, I'll be happy to discuss further details as well. So these are the applications from, from, the, from the data science point of view uh, of these fractional operators. Um, I already brought in some machine learning aspects. And here I'm uh, really focusing on fractional Laplacian so far. Okay, sorry. So what about physics, right? So can we see this non-local operator or these fractional operators in, in, in real physics, physics, physical applications? So this is joint work with a couple of guys from Sandia National Labs uh, uh, Lab, in particular, uh, 
uh, Chester Weiss and Bart Van Blue and Wonders. So Chet is a geophysicist actually. So and I, I, I met him at a uh, conference a few years ago and also I, I already knew Bart uh, for a, uh, from a different conference. So we started talking and um, it, it turned out they were interested in this application called magnetolorics which is you're trying to infer the electrical conductivity inside the earth from some surface measurements. And typically uh, people start with 3D Maxwell's equations and then they derive uh, Helmholtz equation and, and uh, they use that to model this, this, this particular application. So we started with uh, 3D Maxwell's equation as well, but we introduced some constitutive, relation, constitutive law and we arrive at the, the fractional Helmholtz equation. So instead of, if you look at the Helmholtz operator, instead of the fractional La, La, standard Laplacian, we have fractional Laplacian. And we did some numerical simulations. So uh, this is what you see, the so-called apparent resistivity plotted against uh, frequency. Uh, we noticed these bell-shaped curves here, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Uh, this corresponds to the fractional exponent. And S equals to one is the classical case with the standard Laplacian, which was well known. Then we were actually wondering if uh, if this this uh, numerical observations really corresponds to some some actual data. It turned out all over the United States there are several of these magnetolytic stations, and uh, uh, and we uh, Chet invited me to to a geophysics conference in 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 Washington D.C. a few years ago um, be, before the shutdown, of course. And uh, after talking to some other people there, we, we found this uh, data at the station located in Kansas, where which empirically at least, or qualitatively matches almost perfectly with our, uh, with, with, with our numerical experiments. So this was just, just by, by accident, but it was pretty exciting actually. So now we have seen some application in, 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 in physics as well. So let's continue this theme of physics. So, um, we've been also re recently interested in the so-called uh, harmonic maps. And these harmonic maps are, are critical in many applications. So what is a har standard harmonic map? You look at the gradient of U, so forget about fractional Laplacian, look at the gradient of U square and uh, U and also in four. So U, what I call the director field, or it's, it's, it's a vector in, 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 uh, in, in, let's say 2D or in 3D. And we want to make sure that this U lives on the surface of the sphere. So we enforce this uh, unit length, length constraint. And this unit length constraint make the problem extremely hard, actually. Uh, it's, it, it, it leads to highly nonlinear PDEs, as we're going to see uh, pretty soon. And designing algorithms for those problems is also quite uh, challenging. This is a fundamental model when you want to do ferromagnetism or want to study behavior of liquid crystals or if you want to uh, work with continuum mechanics to describe in, in extensible, uh, or uh, inextensible rods and unshareable plates, and in quantum mechanics when you want to capture uh, some spin systems. And I'm gonna get into this quantum mechanics application uh, soon actually. So we um, replace that uh, standard Laplacian or, or the gradient operator by fractional Laplacian. And now you may say, why, why, why are you trying to do that? Because uh, for the reasons that we're gonna see on the next slide, this is a work uh, together with Soren Bartels uh, from Freiburg, Germany and, and uh, Armin Shikora, uh, who is at um, Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh in um, Pennsylvania. So if you want to solve that minimization problem that I mentioned before, you write a gradient flow equation uh, where lambda is Lagrange multiplier corresponding to those unit length constraints. In the classical case, lambda is um, this absolute value of the gradient of u. So if you think of u as an h1 function, so this is just an L1 object actually, for instance. So that, uh, and also it's multiplicative, right? So you you have very less reg, uh, regular, you're dealing with a highly nonlinear problem um, and you, there is a regularity is a serious issue. So uh, when you talk about liquid crystals, for example, or this kind of harmonic uh, maps, people show you this image where they start with, let's say a unit square, and then they put a boundary condition of X or mod X. Uh, of course, that has singularity at uh, X equals zero. So they let 
uh, that 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 boundary condition are uh, run through using this uh, gradient flow map, and typically there is a singularity that uh, supposed to develop in the center. Right. So we, uh, of course, you don't have, not only have point singularity, but you can have line singularity um, as well. There are there are all sorts of singularity that people are interested in um, in in and applications like uh, liquid crystals, for instance. So we wanted to see the behavior of known locality uh, when or or this fractional operator in regarding this gradient flow. So we, I did some simulations. When it comes to exponent 0.4 we saw the typical uh, singularity that you should see in case of your, your Dirichlet energy. And the one on the right corresponds to the fractional exponent 0.2. We saw some known local uh, defects actually, and we were quite excited about it. But then it turned out when I refined the mesh, in fact, it, it is converging to, to a single point as, as, as uh, it, it should actually. So, but the point of using the fractional Laplacian is that you are enforcing less smoothness. So this is a better object in capturing such uh, singular uh, behavior compared to your standard Laplacian, for instance. So that was kind of our sales pitch. There are more details in the paper with numerical algorithms that we develop and also show convergence analysis of those methods. So coming back to this uh, spin, uh, this quantum um, model. So here I'm looking at uh, sort of a walk on, on, on the sphere where SK denotes my uh, spin or the director field. This was a U on the previous uh, slide and Z sub K denotes uh, some lattice point. This guy, Haldane and Shastri, they, um, they, they were trying to study the discrete, um, this, the, this, this type of walks and they write the so-called Hamiltonian, which gives you the inter interaction between um, these this different SIs. Uh, since we enforce the unit length constraint, we, I can rewrite this as uh, written on the right-hand side. And you can also write the equation of motion here, cross denotes the cross product because these are vectors. So if I look at the continuum limit of this object, what we get is uh, square root of fractional Laplacian. So it's really a natural object that, that appears. I'm not trying to make it up. Sorry, you cannot see the equation here at the bottom. I don't know why it's cutting. Yeah, here you go. So you, 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 you see um, your so-called half wave map equation. So this, is a, this equation has a different behavior compared to um, your, your parabolic equation. So, and we see a square root of fractional Laplacian. We extended this framework to more arbitrary case uh, where S, with, with the fractional exponent s. And uh, we see what we are supposed to see. I mean, uh, again, I'm being very, very quick here. So uh, in, 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 in the first example, so what's happening is we, um, we start with an initial condition uh, given like this, and we obtain the so-called solitary waves as uh, we should be observing. In the second case, I'm perturbing a harmonic map. So take c to be zero, so we have zero cosine x sine x. I perturb it by a parameter c, and uh, we see that that they, this this stationary points oscillates between uh, bit, 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 between the harmonic map map configuration configurations. So okay, so we have seen now applications both in data science, in imaging, in in. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and then we saw some applications in physics also, um, in geophysics, also in harmonic maps, and, and now in some quantum spin chains. But now what are these objects? How do you define them? I have a question. So one definition is, I'm sorry? Yeah, I have yeah. a question. So, so when, when you pass from the, uh, the, the physics, uh, physical system to uh, the continuum um, equation, uh, mm -hmm. then you have like rigorous um, proof saying that, okay, when you pass this to the limit, you get the other one or it, there are there, there are papers on that actually. Uh, it's paper, it's a paper of uh, e, uh, Enor Enol E N N O uh, Lenzmann. Mm -hmm. He's in Basel, I think, in in Switzerland, and uh, Armin Shikora. I can, I can provide you reference for that. Yeah, good question. All right. So, how do you define these objects? So, one way to define this is 
um, or the easiest way, you look at the eigen eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of standard Laplacian with, with, with zero boundary conditions. So as you compute like the powers of a matrix, for example, if I know the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, I can just take the powers of eigenvalues to define the powers of the matrix, right? So that's what one thing you can do to define the fractional Laplacian, just take the eigenvalues of Laplacian and raise to the power uh, S. Here, UKs are my Fourier coefficients and uh, phi k are the eigenfunctions of uh, Laplacian. So that's one definition, what I call the, the, the spectral fraction Laplacian. The other definition is the so-called integral fraction Laplacian, where, um, where basically you are defining this using an, an, an integral where you have a singular kernel. Uh, so if X approaches Y, you have a singularity. That's why I wrote this PV here. This is defined in the sense of principal value. So, so uh, Alejandro was asking me earlier on, on you can have different um, uh, like sort of heterogeneity. So if you make this S as a function of uh, X only, for instance, right? So, so you could do that, but it's also possible to have so like we could do S X plus S Y for instance, or S X times S Y to have um, further, for, further sort of heterogeneity. So it's possible to, to create that in this model, but uh, the analysis become ex extremely delicate and it's, it still needs to be done in, in, in full generality in my opinion. So one thing is clear from here that this is a non-local operator because if you want to evaluate this applied to U at a point X, you need to have information about the function U in the entire Rn, right? Uh, if I replace this Rn by omega, we get another definition, the so-called regional fraction Laplacian. I'm gonna mostly focus uh, in today's discussion on these first two definitions. So now the question is, how do you define the boundary value problems corresponding to uh, this integral fraction Laplacian? So let's go back to the classical uh, Dirichlet problem where we have minus delta u equals zero, u equals to g on the boundary, right? This is the standard boundary value problem that, that, that we learn in, in around undergraduate or we teach our undergraduate students. Now, if I try to do the same thing with this integ integral fraction Laplacian and you try to impose the boundary condition on the boundary itself, uh, it turned out this problem is not well posed because if you go back to the definition of the operator, uh, it required information about the function everywhere. So the correct boundary value problem is, you imp or, the, or the exterior value problem is you impose the conditions in the exterior of the domain. Now you may say that uh, this looks a rather uh, a bit strange, but it turned out that this allowed us allowed us to introduce a, a new type of um, a, a new notion of optimal control, uh, which I'm going to hopefully describe today. So if I want to solve these problems, I need the notion of integration by parts because I want to use some sort of finite element method, for instance. So for that, I need to have uh, the notion of non-local uh, normal derivative or the Neumann derivative, right? It turned out it's possible to define that. Uh, it's again, a, another non-local operator. It's not a singular operator because X here lives in the exterior and Y lives in the interior. So it's, it's the interaction between in, inside and outside. That's what boundary is supposed to do, right? For you, uh, when you talk about your classical models. And in fact, you can prove that is if this exponent S approaches one, which is the standard uh, case, your this non-local Neumann uh, derivative approaches your standard uh, normal derivative or, or the flux that, 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 that we are used to. You can, you can prove this rigorously. Uh, there's something is going on in my computer. So uh, analogous to the classical case where you have the standard Green's formula, you can do the same thing now with the fractional Laplacian as well. You can have the, the standard integration by parts. The bilinear form now looks a little more intimidating compared to the classical case. Um, but I mean, things work out analogously, but the details are, are quite uh, intricate and, and not super straightforward actually. Of course, if you want to implement this, you need to resolve this kernel, right? As 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 clear from here, and it's it's not so trivial to implement this. 
uh, but it turned out uh, that people have done boundary element methods for 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 many years, right? I, I know there have been a lot of developments also at SMU. So you you could use those ideas to 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 approximate this 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 object. So I showed you at the beginning all these applications related to imaging and and all that. Um, so we are already seeing that this operator is non-local. So it it's it's seeing much more uh, than the standard Laplacian, which is a local operator. Uh, in addition. Uh, one of the property that we know from the from the from our PDE uh, course is that if the, your domain is smooth and if the data is smooth, then the solution to the standard Laplace equation, for example, or the Poisson equation, is smooth, right? But that's not the case with these uh, fractional operators. Even if your date, uh, domain is smooth, take the unit ball, uh, right hand side is one smooth, uh, zero in the exterior zero is the exterior condition you can write explicitly what the solution should be and the classical shift theorem that we know if the right hand side is in l2 then you gain two derivatives that does not uh, hold true in this case always and that makes it exciting for this uh, applications with jump discontinuities actually and that's why actually it's it's, it's working uh, reasonably well all right, so we can define some Sobolev spaces as well. It's a it's it's a very busy slide. I'm going to skip this, um, uh, but just want to emphasize that if you want to study the problems with this integral fraction Laplacian, you introduce this the the usual uh, Sobolev space, which is W S two. These are uh, functions which are in L two, and this Gagliardo semi norm is uh, finite. And the exterior you impose the the zero um, condition. So there are some implementation aspects. Um, there is a lot of uh, work in the recent years. Um, I'm flashing this slide in case you're interested. I'll, I, I recommend you to, to, to have a look, um, uh, but I will not go into the uh, details of this actually. Um, for I, I even have some code on my website in case you're interested. Um, all right, so since this, uh, seminar also has control aspects. So uh, we look at some optimal control problems as well. So a typical optimal control for problem for me is, um, I don't know, your, your stationary uh, heat equation, for instance, uh, but I have some non-linearity here, let's say. So I'm trying to make the problem a bit more challenging. And uh, I, I, uh, I want to match uh, temperature U to a desired quantity u sub t. So I want to attain a, a desired temperature in certain part of my domain and my uh, source, uh, which is, let's say, uh, I don't know, the, uh, my, my HVAC uh, vent, um, that's an unknown. So I want to figure out what source I should apply so I can attain a desired uh, temperature profile, for example. So that's my uh, typical optimal control problem. So, um, if you can you can you can study this problem first if you want to like really develop all the mathematical analysis you have to understand how to deal with this problem actually and a key challenge here is to show that your solution is uh, uniformly bounded in the sense of l infinity um, for fractional Laplacian you can you can do that but with this nonlinearity it's much more challenging. Uh, in, if you're familiar with it, uh, if you're not, that's okay too. But you you can develop uh, this this uh, this Stumpakia yeah, cutoff function type argument, um, and it's a bit more delicate when you work with these non-local operators compared to the classical case. So this work is uh, published in in couple of the, uh, this this couple of papers. All right, so here my control is in the interior, right? So this is what I'm going to call distributed control. And when it comes to, um, so I've, what about, remember at the beginning, I, I, I showed you guys this, this boundary, this exterior value problem. And I said that this looks rather artificial. So what do you do with it, right? So typically control lies, let's say this is my domain, this square. Control lies either on the boundary or in the interior. But because of this non-local behavior of the operator, I can have exterior control. So this is a new notion of optimal control that we introduced in 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 these papers, uh, where where you where the control is not uh, is really detached from your um, 
domain omega. We call it the exterior optimal control. So there are some benefits uh, already. Uh, how physical this is, uh, is, is still up for debate, honestly. So, but at least we found something interesting mathematically and uh, at, at numerical examples are interesting too. All right, so, I mean, there are problems where you don't want your temperature to, to cross a certain threshold, right? So you don't want temperature to go above some U sub B, let's say, and those problems are delicate. So U is the solution, let's say, uh, uh, to this, this partial differential equation, and this operator AS could be uh, your parabolic operator, which is the, the, the time-dependent uh, fractional heat equation or your, or your standard um, stationary heat equation. If you impose this type of constraints, then uh, you it's it's challenging because uh, if you're familiar with 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 optimization, especially in infinite dimensions, um, the the if you try to study this problem in this in the solid spaces, then it turned out your problem may not have uh, so, so the, your problem may not fulfill the usual constraint qualifications, and. Uh, so th that's why typically people study this, uh, they impose these constraints in the sense of continuous functions. If you do that, then there are more challenges. Then uh, you have to deal with the dual of continuous functions, which are uh, Radon measures. So, uh, so that, yeah, that brings its own challenge, but Radon measures are not too bad, right? Uh, we, can, we, we can work with them mathematically and also we can approximate them uh, numerically. So we did that in, 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 in these couple of papers. So now we can deal with optimal control problems where, um, where we, we can have constraints on, on the control variable, but we can also have constraints on, on this uh, state variable. I mean, this is very realistic, actually. It happens in, in applications. So, but in all these, applica all these examples for control, I assume that the fractional exponent was given to me, right? Uh, I'm making a choice for that. But if I don't know what that is, I could make that as a random variable. If I make that this S as a random variable, then my solution becomes a random field. And then my objective function J becomes a random variable itself. So I need, I cannot minimize a random variable. So I need to uh, scalarize it. I, I can take an expected value of that, uh, that objective function. I, I, I'm allowed to do that. But it turned out, that expected value is like take, taking the average, right? So in finance literature, people have developed the so-called risk measures. So um, which, so if, if, if you think about uh, an example of risk measure is uh, the so-called mean plus semi-deviation. So you're trying to minimize the deviations above the mean value. So in the typical uh, uh, mean plus deviation, this max will not be there, right? So, but here I'm looking at the semi-deviation uh, this is one example of risk measure. The other example is the conditional value at risk, where you try to minimize the, the, the expectation of the tails of your distribution. So why do people care about this, these risk measures? Is because they, they, that this way you can handle the, the extreme events. And that's why people adopt this in, in, the, in, in, in finance, actually. So this is like sort of a gold standard. So we're trying to bring those ideas uh, more, more, in, more towards the engineering and, and the physics side. So, so this theory that we develop in this paper, um, uh, together with Drew Curry from Sandia National Lab and Johannes Pfeffer, a former postdoc, um, it's, it's, it's built around this, this, this general um, risk measures. And the key, one of the key challenge was that we pose this partial differential equation in, in, the, in a solute space like HS. And now my S is the random variable. So your solute space regularity is changing. So how do you deal with that situation? So it's not a typical um, uh, diffusion equation where the diffusion coefficient is a random variable uh, or right hand side is a random variable, right? So, 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 so you have to be a little bit careful. So, so I, have a, I have a question. So here S yeah. is the parameter that you you, you play with, right? So normally what people randomize is like the boundary or what they, I mean, the, the uh, in uh, uncertainty quantification, what they, um, they, they put a random variable because uh, because they, they say that when they measure there's something wrong. So they put the randomness normally in the boundary or 
So X is simply a parameter that you um, you choose uh, in the optimization problem. So so I'm not I'm I'm not cho choosing S anymore. I'm making it random variable because I don't know what it is. I don't know its behavior. Mm -hmm. So pre previously I made a choice mm -hmm. of what S should be, but we don't know actually right S in principle. So we we if we don't know it. So as you just exactly said, if you don't know the behavior of para some parameters, you can model those parameters as random variables. And that's what I'm doing. I'm making S as a random variable. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So we have done some other works uh, re re regarding these fractional operators. So in particular, like developing some multigrid ideas uh, to solve these optimal control problems. Uh, in, uh, we're mostly interested in geometric multigrid. We looked at more, uh, more, more technical problems where, uh, for instance, the P Laplacian type problems. We're trying to identify the coefficients. Um, and we also developed some reduced basis type methods to solve these problems more efficiently, actually, because these problems are, 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 are quite challenging. We also looked at uh, some, some, some contact type problems like variational inequalities. Uh, in particular, we also looked at quasi variational inequalities where your obstacle could depend on the solution as well. Um, one of the works is published in Interface and Free Boundaries Journal, and the other one it should be 2021 uh, in SIAM Math Analysis. All right, so now I'm going to, sorry, this, uh, something is going on with my computer. I don't know what's going on. All right, so at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned this. Uh, so how much time do I have been? I think you have around uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, then I'm going to skip this part and go to uh, more, more, more neural network stuff. So I have only had a couple of slides. So let's try to solve uh, some parameterized partial differential equations using neural networks. So here I have a PDE parameterized by parameter C. U is the solution to the PDE, right? And let's just consider a discrete formulation for the moment, but you can write it as a continuous problem also. Um, because u belongs to some r and x, that's the dimension of the solution. And we have a parameter to solution map. Um, and this problem is challenging if you, uh, if n is large, n x is large, uh, right? Um, and if you have to solve this problem for different parameters, right? If you're trying to solve some inverse problem, or if you're trying to solve those control problems that I mentioned earlier, where uh, uh, c could be a control variable, then you have to solve this multiple times. So uh, people use reduced basis method, for instance, um, but it turned out those are uh, intrusive methods uh, when it comes to um, nonlinear problems. Just your standard POD uh, or pro proper orthogonality composition or your, your greedy method, for instance, they, they, they tend to be intrusive. So then we were, we were curious if we can uh, approximate this parameter to solution map using a neural network. So, and, and, it, and it turned out it's possible. So what is our training data? And so I'm talking about supervised learning. My training data is we have parameter x c one to C N S and the corresponding, uh, let's say high fidelity solutions that I compute. And these are done a priori, right? I'm generating some data. These are the solution to my, my partial differential equation corresponding to different uh, data, uh, corresponding to different parameters. Then if I can uh, do like a sort of a uh, feed forward type, actually this, this is a neural network with skip connection because uh, I have added uh, this lower order term. If I remove this term, then we get the, the your usual feed forward neural, neural network. But at the end of the day, uh, if I do composition of all these FIs, we get an approximation of the solution to your partial differential equation. So if I know, uh, if you give me a new parameter, uh, then I can just evaluate the solution to your PDE. I don't need to go back to the PDE um, ever again, right? But of course, there is no free lunch. We still have to learn this, these weights, WIs and the biases, BIs, right? So there are, there, are, there are two questions at this point. One question is more from the analysis point of view or the approximation theory point of view. Uh, how well is this U hat approximating my continuous solution U, right? 
So this is like when we do finite element analysis, we discretize using a problem using finite, finite element or finite difference method. We want to understand a priori, how good is that approximation? And this is a very ch challenging problem actually. We have some partial results uh, based on the work of Seagal and Jin Chao Xu uh, from Penn State. Then the next question is how do you determine these parameters theta, which is my weights and biases? So uh, to, uh, to learn these parameters, we solve an optimization problem, right? Um, so, and then if you remember the neural network that I wrote here, and we have a parameter H uh, sitting, right? So if I take this J minus FJ minus one on the left-hand side and divide through by H uh, and take the limit, uh, what we get is an ODE, uh, right? So it's an, it's, an, it's an nonlinear ODE. So this was already observed uh, by, by Rutoto and, and Haber. And I think it was observed even before these guys in, in one of the papers. Uh, but they really um, uh, brought this up, I think. So uh, what we are were interested in, so now uh, here on the previous slide, so here one layer is connected to the next layer and the next layer is connected to the next layer, right? But we wanted to see how can we connect all the layers to one another. And our motivation was this, this dense neural network which is uh, quite popular actually in this neural network community where all the layers are connected to one another. They don't have any mathematical formulation. They just did something and came up with a new architecture. So we were trying to see if we can uh, use sort of that motivation, come up with a mathematical model. So what we do is we replace this standard ODE by the fractional in time ODE. So previously I talked about the fractional uh, space derivative. Now I'm talking about fractional time derivative. It's also a non-local operator. So to evaluate this fractional time derivative of order gamma at a point T, uh, I need to integrate uh, from zero to T. So I need to have information about the function all the way uh, at, at T equals zero. So, so no, it's not just the, the local object, like local time derivative that, that, that we typically work with. So this is what we did in our uh, publication. So in the first paper, we were more interested in the classification type problems as, as many people are. And then we extended these ideas to approximate these partial differential equations. This is a joint work with Howard Ullman from University of Maryland in College Park. Akumun Onwunta, he was a postdoc of mine. He just uh, joined Lehigh uh, University as a, a, a tenure track assistant professor. And Dipanshu Verma, who's a PhD student in, of mine, he just joined Emory University as a postdoc. So uh, the question is, how well does this work? So I'll show you one example because I am running out of time and sorry, my slides are misbehaving. So in this, this example was taken from this paper of um, uh, Andy Stewart, Patrick Farrell and uh, uh, two other guys from 2017, where they're trying to understand, uh, figure out the distribution of the diffusion coefficient on part of the boundary, they had uh, pure Neumann conditions and on the other part of the boundary, they had uh, this, this Rob anti-boundary condition. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a non-convex geometry. And uh, if you, they introduce several um, um, ways of inferring this, 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 this parameter C using, using the Bayesian setting. And uh, interestingly, they even put out a code. And so we actually use their code to make sure that, that uh, we, are, we are doing the fair comparison. So if you use the full model, it was taking around three hours to do this, this parameter inference. And if you use this uh, fractional DNN idea that I mentioned, it was like 18 minutes. So it, it was con considerable saving. I'm not saying this is a silver bullet, but I, but I, I think it's, it's, it seems like it's, it's, it's worth looking at. And there are many, many, many open questions at this point. So, and then uh, um, a couple of months ago, or maybe a month ago or so, or um, yeah, a few weeks ago, we stumbled upon something very interesting. Uh, and I will show you quickly, related to neural network. And so this applies to any neural network. So let's say you have trained your neural network, right? So people draw these fancy diagrams, which uh, as a mathematician, it took me a while uh, what exactly what they were trying to say. But let's say these nodes denote some biases. So 
I don't know, uh, uh, my wife and I, we have a 20 month old son and he likes to mess with things. So he comes in and he, he uh, moves this bias A to B. So he exchanges these two, right? So my architecture is still the same, but the solution is completely different at this point. So there is a so much known uniqueness in this neural network. And this is a type of known uniqueness that we have not noticed in the literature actually before. Uh, that nobody seemed to talk about this. Uh, maybe some people do, and, and we are just naive and we haven't been able to find this reference. But there is a known uniqueness when you train the neural network because you're solving a non-convex optimization problem, but this type of known uniqueness is slightly different. Uh, even with for a small network here, we just have two layers and 10 points in each layer. You can have millions of combinations, right? So, uh, so it was just like a, a, an observation and we wanted to fix this issue. So one way we thought we can fix this issue is, so if your neural network that I showed earlier, if I write in the abstract sense, you don't need to check all the details, but what we did was we order these biases in an increasing order. So before we did not impose any, any constraints on biases, right? But now in my neural network, in my training, I'm going to impose the constraint that the biases in each layer are uh, increasing order. So here la la L corresponds to uh, layer and J corresponds to each neuron in each. So in each layer, we have a bunch of neurons, right? So I'm ordering the, the, the biases in each layer. And that makes apparently a huge difference when it comes to uh, computational results. I'll show you one example. Um, as a part of a bigger project uh, related to chemical reacting flows, um, it's a joint work with my colleague, Raina Leoner, uh, who is the director of CFD Center here at GMU. Fumiya Togahashi, he works at Applied Simulation Inc. It's a, um, a, a company in, in, in Washington, D.C. area. Um, uh, former student Dipanshu and uh, former postdoc um, of mine, Tom Brown. So what's the key challenge? So uh, in these chemical reacting flows, uh, you basically have to couple uh, fluid dynamics equations and, uh, and, and, and stiff ODEs. So uh, one example is uh, combustion, for, for instance. Uh, and all, I learned all this from, from my colleague, Reinhard, of course. Um, so it turned out that at the moment it's, it's taking 99% so 99 of the solver time is spent on solving these stiff ODEs. So fluid dynamics, we have really effic efficient solvers. Uh, this is a big project. Uh, for us, this is funded by DTRA um, from, 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 from DOD. Um, and now what we were trying to do was, can we replace this, this uh, this chemistry or this chemical reaction by, by neural network. So one, uh, one package is uh, Camkin, for instance, it's not a, it's not, it's, it's not a free package, but this is what people uh, use at, at, at uh, DOD. There are, uh, there are others too. So I'll not get into all the details. I just want to show you uh, some results. So blue corresponds to the actual data. So here we have, um, I think eight species of oxygen, hydrogen, uh, HO2, OH, and blah, blah, and then also temperature. So blue corresponds to the actual um, solution and the, the red corresponds to training uh, or the neural network solution when we did not order these biases. And the black corresponds to the result when we ordered these biases in each layer. So we obtained actually significantly uh, uh, good results. I mean, you may say you're trying to approximate ODEs, so what's the big deal? Actually, it's a quite a challenging problem because if you look at these chemical reactions, so nothing is happening, nothing is happening, then all of a sudden you get a bump and then nothing happens. So to capture just this bump, it's 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 a highly non-trivial problem. And the scale is, is extremely small. So if you look at the x-axis, it's on the order of 10 to the minus five or minus six. Uh, sometimes even the y-axis, the scales are, are extremely small. So it's a very, very challenging problem. So I'm just going to summarize uh, what I mentioned today. So I started with several applications uh, of fractional Laplacian in imaging and also in, in geophysics, in magnetic fluorics. Uh, briefly mentioned the idea of fractional diffusion maps and fractional harmonic maps. 
Um, I didn't get into too much detail on the optimal control, but just the take home message is that we were able to introduce this new notion of optimal control if you use this fractional uh, Laplacian as an operator. I also briefly mentioned this concept of risk covers optimization, where we are looking at risk measures. Um, and we have looked at this object S of X. At the beginning of my talk, I also mentioned the idea of bi level optimization and solving the lower level problem using some sort of projected gradient method and treating that as a neural network. I mentioned the idea of this fractional deep neural network where we uh, use this ODE point of view, but instead of the, the standard ODE, we look at the fractional ODE. And uh, I also mentioned briefly this idea of ordering biases, uh, which can be applied in any network. Actually, it's very easy, easy to incorporate in, in, in TensorFlow or in PyTorch, for instance. All right, so that's all what I wanted to say and I appreciate uh, your attention and I'm happy to have discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier, for the very beautiful talk. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Steve Sekula has one. Go ahead, Steve. Hey, yeah, no, thanks for this presentation. Um, I'm, I'm always a little slow. So I was absorbing Sorry. something on one of your slides and then it uh -huh. changed and I didn't write it down. There was a slide where you were talking about, uh, I think it was thermal fins. Yes. And applying some of the work you were talking about at that point. Yeah, here, here we go. Okay, so yeah, all right. So, so this is a problem about thermal flow in presumably small fins. How, how small would we be talking here or does it not matter? Um, so for, for the analysis that we did, it doesn't matter actually. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah, Yeah, on, honestly, I don't have exact dimensions on the top of my head uh, at the moment, but the analysis that we did, it, 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 it does not matter. Okay, but right, yes, so, this uh, this yeah this application in, that we took from this paper was really motivated by something realistic. Sorry to interrupt. Oh no no, no that's okay. So that the that was sort of the, the lead in question. The real question I wanted to ask you is this is about heat transfer in these fins, but in, I'm curious, could this also be applied to, for instance, the propagation of phonons? Uh, at, for if you if this material were ultra cold, so mm -hmm. that there was very little to no actual heat. And then one injects quantized vibrational energy into this in the form of phonon. So, so basically quantized heat. Could mm -hmm. this be used to look at the propagation of phonons in ultra cold situations? The reason I ask this is there are projects that use fins like this to in fact read out phonon energy from a crystal. Mm -hmm. And the state of that simulation may benefit from detailed maps of how the phonons actually propagate out to the readout electronics. So how do they model this behavior in case of phonons? Are there PDE operators or? Uh, so that would be a question for the faculty involved in that. So I'm going to go ask I them see. that later on. I see. I see. <laughs> but uh, but I, this just got me thinking about, I mean, I know that the Monte Carlo simulations for those are very piecemeal. And I don't know how they handle that particular part of the simulation in order to model gains and losses in the actual readout of phonon energy. You know, we're yes. you know, losing even a little bit would be a big deal in a system like this. So. Right. So it sounds like if they're doing some Monte Carlo simulation, so they have some parameters and maybe they are doing some, some, some parametric solves of some parametric systems. So in, in that sense, my, I don't know, just a very, very wild guess, so, sorry, not knowing anything about the problem, uh, that this, this abstract framework that we have can be applied. Because uh, when I started off, right, at the, big, at the beginning of this section, so it was quite quick, I started with a very abstract parameterized uh, PDE or, or, or an ODE. Right. So um, I do not see why we cannot apply this. Okay. All right, yeah, I've got the reference to the work on yeah. the slide. So that was the other thing I wanted to steal while it was up. So I, I'll, Definitely. I'll print that out and have a look at it. Thanks. Definitely, happy to follow up or email okay. or, or, yeah. Thank um, you. I have I have a question. So at the end, I lost on this beautiful idea of you for bias ordering, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 can can you explain uh, again? So when when you add this ordering, what is the the gain for? I mean, I just, I just miss. So <laughs> what's what's happening is, so so you know we have. Um, so I'm going to 
uh, stop sharing for a second and I will write something on my board. <laughs> so, you know, we have uh, layers, right? Uh, in, 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 in your neural network, can you see? Yes, yes. Okay. And then inside the layers, we have these neurons, right? Mm -hmm. So I was saying that uh, technically speaking, I can, uh, I mean, let's say we have done the training and, but, but there is still a lot of freedom we have. So I can exchange this, um, actually, so let me draw this with, uh, with, with blue and this with red. I can exchange these two neurons, right? So this becomes uh, red and this becomes blue. So there is a lot of non-uniqueness, right? So, and, and each layer, I have a vector bias, uh, let's say denoted by uh, B sub L, right? And it has components. So uh, B1 to some B N components, right? So, and this was the exchange that I was uh, 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 taking into account. But if I order these biases, while training. So I'm not doing them by hand. So I'm incorporating this into my uh, training algorithm where I, so these biases B1 will be less than equal to B2 in each layer, right? So this depends on L2 to be uh, L. So I'm, so I'm ordering them while we are doing the training. So that will uh, that that then in the end, if I'm done with the training, I cannot go back and exchange, uh, do this exchange any longer because that's not going to be a viable solution, right? So and in the and also uh, behind the scene, in some sense, we are we are fixing the known uniqueness of uh, weights too, right? So weights are the matrices. So I don't want to order the 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 matrices. Then the problem becomes even more challenging because biases. This is a vector and I'm working with components. So it was easier to uh, order them. So we are introducing more uniqueness into the system when we do the ordering. This is and that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Arvira, uh, uh, let me, um, I mean, we're losing a, a few of our uh, audience, but uh, it occurred to me on the fly and I will put Bin to the task also that uh, what I will ask you, and I will ask uh, all uh, upcoming speakers, a little bit of a homework. Um, if you could send us, Ben or myself, a, 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 a bibliography where paper one would be, what is, what do you think is the best possible paper that you find that to introduce to the, your topic of interest? And maybe mm -hmm. two, three that relates to some of the applications. I mean, we certainly through the recorded, uh, uh, video, we have uh, references that we could, the, some of us may go directly into it, but maybe uh, it would be nice that we build bibliography for the benefit of the, the, the younger people. So, so think about that as a, as a suggestion, not for this moment, but at some yeah. point, uh, send us two, three references for us to build bibliography for the DCIA. Definitely, we'll be we'll, we'll be happy to do that. Actually, and it sounds like a great idea. Now, uh, now on a question uh, in the um, going back to the, the the particular application that Steve mentioned uh, in a diffusive process, uh, could it be that instead of having a highly variable uh, diffusion coefficient, that the problem in itself has a fractional diffusion? That is, that the operator is not um, in itself the gradient, but um, once again, going to your theme. Right, right. That's, that's, that's possible too. So in that case, you will be, uh, your parameter will be the fractional exponent, let's say. So you both. can parameterize maybe both, yeah. uh, the exponent yeah. and the coefficient. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. No, it's, it, the, the framework allows that, has the flexibility. On the question that you, that you meant on the, Top topic that you mentioned that they, you don't know the S, it's a random variable and you still optimize certain moments or whatever. Is it still also that you extract some feature of S itself, like the mean value of S or, or it is that you're extracting some other, other things? 
what is uh, uh we were yeah. we were more interested in the yeah it's a good question actually so we were in that case we were more interested in the control variable so so here so we are more interested in the control variable which is uh, resilient to uncertainty so the control is always uh, deterministic even though the solution to the pde u may is a random variable because s is a random variable but the control itself is 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 deterministic because if a deterministic control then i couldn't uh, and i can apply it right in in a in in a real application but if the right. control becomes a random variable then it's harder so we yeah i understand that but what was the objective of the problem what it is that you want to get out of it by putting a deterministic control that 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 the whatever control we are getting is resilient to uncertainty in the system so if you have uh, forget about fractional PDE, right? If you right, have right. The, the, if you have diffusion equation where the, you have unknown diffusion coefficient, like in the in 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 that flow problem later on, if you model that diffusion coefficient as a random variable and there is some control that's happening, right? You want to make sure that the control is accounting for uh, for uncertainty. Control is resilient to uncertainty. Okay. So, I mean, we are flying, we, we don't fly that much anymore, but if it starts wobbling <laughs> the plane, we want to make sure that we have controllers. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, so are there any other questions? So, if not, uh, we thank um, uh, Javier for the very beautiful talk and uh, a personal uh, I personally have learned a lot from your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arbit. Uh, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, thanks, everyone. Great seeing everybody and great meeting uh, Alejandro, Ben, of course, and Steven. I see yeah, you. Know, thanks also. very much for this. This was very yeah. stimulating. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye. Yeah, bye. 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 Hope bye. to see you in person someday. See you in person. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs>